I uh, am very excited today to be having this discussion with sales comp leaders with you know the experience and, and the background uh, that they have, like Aaron and Dal, uh, as well as Mark, who uh, brings the kind of perspective from the consultant, from the consulting and, and external advisory perspective. I think this is a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, the role of sales compensation is a very difficult one. It's one that is, uh, you know, requires a lot of analytical, technical, and stakeholder management skill sets. And it's one that having a career path in is both, you know, extremely, it's a, it's a difficult role, but it's extremely rewarding as you get to experience such a broad nature of the business and, and you're so close to, to everything that occurs. And so very excited to dive in and, um, and hear from everyone on the, on the panel today about how, you know, they think about career progression and sales competition and ultimately how they think about supporting and scaling their teams. Um, uh, so maybe it'd be great to just quickly do a, uh, a set of intros and I'll pass it to Aaron, uh, Shulan to do an intro and then Dell and then Mark. Hi everybody. Uh, I'm Aaron Shulan. I'm the global director of sales comp at Ceridian. I'm based in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, and I have been at Ceridian for about three years and been in compensation for about 15 Hello everyone, uh, Dallas Sidhu. I'm the head of global sales compensation here at uh, at Zoom. Uh, I started in Zoom in uh, 2021, so it's been a bit of, about a couple of years. Um, I came from SAP, where I spent about 20 plus years of my career there in various roles. Um, in compensation, I've probably been doing it for about 15 years, um, and uh, I live in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Excellent. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, this is Mark Wallace. Uh, I am in our uh, advisory group uh, focusing uh, on sales compensation uh, with Corn Ferry, uh, which is a uh, which is a human resources, both search and uh, um, uh, consulting firm uh, and based in Chicago, although today I am in San Francisco. Perfect. No, it's great to great to have such a you know, strong panel and, and especially for today's discussion. I think I'd love to just jump right in and especially for, you know, Aaron and Dal, your background, your experience, how did you guys both climb the ladder? And maybe we'll start with you, uh, Aaron. How did you get to your role in the world of sales comp? Uh, so I'm going to venture to guess that most people don't start out here, that you find your way here like I did. Um, and so I actually started out my career as a recruiter recruiting for sales ops. Um, and then I moved into the sales ops team and did that um, for a few years and moved into sales from there. I worked in sales for about three years, um, kind of like starting up some burgeoning sales channels. Um, and then I moved back into sales ops. Um, and business operations and then kind of expanded my role over time. Um, to include, you know, marketing operations, just general business operations, go to market, compensation administration, um, and kind of took turns doing all of those things um, and, and across several industries. But um, you know, compensation has sort of always gone with me, uh, especially as part of my sales ops roles. It's something I've had for a long time. Um, and now I just kind of exclusively specialize in that. It is a very, yeah, no one wakes up wanting to be a sales comp specialist. <laughs> you don't go to school right. for that, that's for sure. Um, it's interesting because it's the tail end of the of the of of all the strategy work. So everything you do upstream and rev ops and 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 marketing operations, all of that at the end of the day funnels into data that feeds into sales comp. Process. So it's a natural kind of progression to getting there. But uh, curious, Dell, how 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 does your journey differ? Um, well, I started as a sales compensation analyst um back in in the year 2000 um back then when i first started i honestly didn't even know what ote was you know on target earning like what the hell is that what are you guys talking about um so it's been a lot of time to kind of really understanding compensation because i came from a an accounting background um and really had no idea about what commissions were um so you know as my manager you know as his scope was expanding you know my scope was also expanding so after a few years, I took on uh, more of the, the entire department of sales compensation. And, you know, when I started, it was like one and a half person. I eventually grew to about eight people at one point. 
Um, I then transitioned more into a sales operations role, focusing more on character design, propensity modeling, sales forecasting, headcount planning, you know, analytics. Um, and then from there, moved into partner operations, um, then moved into solution operations, um, and then led a, a uh, go-to-market strategy for one of our a, a large business unit that we had at SAP. Um, and then eventually moved back into sales compensation my last five or six years at SAB before I moved into moved at Zoom. So my career spans about 20 years. And uh, along that time frame, you know, I probably spent about almost half of my, my life in sales compensation. So I'm curious because there's an interesting, uh, interesting kind of commonality is that there's an kind of an in and out growth trajectory of kind of leaving the world of sales company and coming back. And I'm curious, was there, you know, like in that in that initial role where you first encountered sales comp, was there a clear path to growth within sales comp or and this opportunity, these opportunities kind of came out of the blue or did you leave sales comp because you felt like you couldn't grow? It's an interesting question. So when I first started in sales compensation, there really wasn't a clear path. Uh, you know, it was, it was a, a fairly yep. new role. Even my manager was new at it. Like he wasn't really, you know, he didn't come from a sales compensation background. So we were kind of learning as we went. And I would say that was probably a little bit frustrating because like, okay, yeah, my scope is growing and that that can always be rewarding. But it's like, am I learning more about the business? And compensation is a great, you know, few steps in terms of getting a good idea, getting grounded on what, you know, motivates a sales organization. but in order to kind of get more rounded experience, you actually have to have to go out of sales compensation. And that was one of the things that I really yeah. wanted to do is kind of get more, more depth and, and, and exposure in other areas, which is why I kind of took on other roles. Um, you know, it was, I kind of look back now and just like, okay, yeah, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but really that's what kind of made it fun and cool about it because I had the opportunity to chart my own path. Right. Like nobody said, hey, you have to do this or you have to go this way. You know, it kind of gave you an opportunity to kind of, you know, explore and and, you know, take some risks and do stuff that was outside of your comfort zone. And, you know, looking back now, it's just like, hey, that was that was kind of neat. Right. You know, I, I was able to kind of do things where where other people probably were more stuck in a in a formalized, uh, formalized cure path. And I had an opportunity to kind of go sideways up down and and get a little bit more exposure in the organization. Yeah, no, I, I feel like um, sales compensation as a starting point does give you a broad surface area into the organization. You get to see a bunch of different parts and you can kind of, to your point, navigate. Uh, curious, Mark, from your perspective and kind of seeing the you know the world, maybe, maybe it's similar to kind of my experience as a consultant and seeing sales comp having a seat at the table more and more at the strategic level. Like if I remember even back in my early, you know, when I started my career, to now, sales comp went from being very much administrative function and, and the silos of strategy and execution to now it's almost table stakes that a CRO is going to bring in their, their compensation team as a part of a planning cycle and a strategic element. And so maybe maybe that has had more to do with the kind of the growth of I saw you, I saw you nod when yeah. Dan mentioned that there wasn't a career opportunity in the past versus now. So I'd love to hear your perspective on that. Yeah, absolutely. And I definitely echo uh, Aaron and Dell's uh, viewpoints uh, just in terms of the, the journey itself. Um, I, uh, just to get, uh, Nabil, to your point, um, I do think that the evolution of how sales compensation is treated has changed significantly. Um, it was not a career path. So I, just to give you a little bit of background, I actually started um in the 90s with uh negotiating with unions and engaging in labor relations discussions and um i pivoted uh to look more at sales comp primarily because a a lot of those jobs were going away and so there was less demand for that but also um we as a consulting firm were even though we were in rewards we weren't really taking on those jobs because they weren't seen as rewards jobs, even though it's sales compensation. So there is nobody doing it. Um, uh, in matter of fact, in a lot of cases, uh, the, uh, the sales compensation plan was kept confidential by the sales organization. Uh, and it wasn't shared with anybody. Um, and that's definitely, uh, that's definitely changed. It's more of a discipline now 
Um, and uh, it is more of a discipline because sales has become for many organizations um, a much more strategic part of the business. Whereas before it was a more a fulfillment type of business where you, you know, your, your, your transactions look mostly the same. So um, it, the more transactions are better. So that's all that matters. Um, not very strategic, but what we have seen, at least with our clients is that sales is all about how you're structuring your relationship with the people who are buying your goods and services. And are you building longer term relationships? Are you leveraging the data that you have, for example, to give better uh, feedback to um, to your clients? So as a result, sales is more strategic. And so what we see is that how they're compensated, there's been a realization that um, it needs to have uh, uh, it needs to be integrated into the strategic planning for the organization uh, for that reason. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, still quick on that. I think sales comp, especially now, is is one of the largest cost centers in the business. And yeah. I think we we touched on this, uh, you know, in our in a previous discussion, Dell and Aaron around, uh, you know, the sales comp team is effectively the ambassador or the you know the financial investment advisor to the organization on how you deploy this investment, which is the sales comp dollars you do, you put out to the sales team to motivate and drive specific behaviors. Um, and I think, yeah, it's, so it's certainly very exciting time now and, and, and thinking about that kind of career path and the career growth coming in as a role, maybe to kind of shift, uh, you know, the, the topic to building out and scaling that team. You know, I, I'd love to kind of dive in to the makeup of that team. And, and maybe we'll start with you, Aaron. What do you think makes a great sales comp analyst? So somebody who is definitely willing to get out of their comfort zone, I would say there is so much. Um, we we want to be comfortable being uncomfortable because there is so much to look at and to do. This, this job is never done. It is always about getting better and getting sharper, evaluating where we are, you know, how can we pivot? What do we need to change? So somebody who is really unafraid of, of hard work and consistent work, I want somebody who's going to give me their thoughts and opinions and be a thought partner with me. Um, you know, and somebody who is, you know, I, I think that, you know, Donald and I both share that sales ops experience. I mean, any kind of experience actually working in the business that you can bring to the table is so helpful. I think that not to back up to the former conversation, but you know, it used to be somebody who took direction from the business to execute what the business wanted. And now we are a strategic partner telling them how to achieve their goals and objectives. And so, you know, anybody who has been in the business and has some um, experience and can bring that to the table, I think that's absolutely helpful and becoming critical. I guess from your perspective, Dal, um, would you would you feel the same? I, I I definitely resonate with what Aaron's saying around that experience that you bring in to that role and the accountability that needs to be brought. It's kind of a good mix. But Chris, there's anything else that you look for? No, absolutely. I think what Aaron had on was was a lot of the the, the you know the, the finer points of you know being a strategic partner, being somebody a, a thought leader. You know, even as a comp analyst, you you need to be able to kind of have that. So that you're able to, you know, share off each other, right? Share ideas and think about ways that things you can do better and improve it, and you know, look at what what feedback you might be getting from a sales organization to say, hey, how do we? Hey, here's what I'm hearing a lot of, you know, what do we? What can we do about it, right? And and some of it's some of it's warranted, and some of it could be just you know sour grapes, but you know, you kind of need to look at all those aspects. And and for a good comp analyst, they need to be able to be able to listen. Um, and not react right away, but really listen and understand, well, what's the motivating factors here, right? And and really have the ability to learn, observe, and absorb, right? And I think that's important that, you know, sometimes we get, as a comp analyst, because there's so much pressure on, you know, the deadlines and everything else, you kind of forget about that path. You forget about, you know, having a little bit of empathy because you're you're so consumed with your, your you know, your day-to-day and if you get, you know, a, a few people that are might be a little bit irate because you're talking about sensitivity in people's pay, 
you know, that that can kind of set you off as well, right? And and I think one of the things as a as a sales comp analyst, you got to make sure that you don't take it personally, right? It's it's not you, it's not on you, it's just the the the, the way of the job. Um, and sometimes you do have to have that big say, I hear you, right? Let me try to figure out what your problem is versus trying to get into that, you know, a, a negative interaction with that, with those individuals, because that can also have a very detrimental impact uh, on, on your, on your sort of, you know, how, how you perceive your role, right? Because that, you know, if you're getting hit every single day, you know, it can, it can really weigh on you mentally as well. So you kind of have to kind of take your work from your 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 personal life out of it, not take the emotion out of it. We'll focus on the facts, focus on what's important, and really understand what you're hearing versus reacting to it. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, I think uh, you know we always talk about the kind of the, the tripod of of skill sets within sales comp is that you need to be technical, analytical, and a great stakeholder like manager. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, there's one, one person dropped in the chat here, the ability to simplify complexity, which I actually think is very astute and, and, and on, on point comment, which is, um, and, you know, Vince DaCosta, thank you for sharing that. I think, you know, to me, it's, it embodies the, uh, you know, the requirements very well, because to take something complex, the data pipelines, the underlying data, the business rules, and distill that to a stakeholder that's not that's not their day-to-day -day job. Their day-to-day -day job is to go generate revenue for the business and interact. And ultimately, you know, to do that, you have to have that skill set and the curiosity to learn and the accountability and stakeholder management to have the patience to try to simplify that and get that to understand. Um, I don't know, Mark, is there anything else that that you, you would add given, you know, from what you see across the clients that you work with? Yeah, I, I completely share that view. I think, um, the the ability to focus on well I'll, I'll take a step back we've done research that shows what is the what 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 where do we see a correlation between sales compensation and selling success um, and generally the greatest place that we see alignment is when sales compensation is really no more than one or two components to it and that's it. So very, very basic design. And it's hard to do that because it's so sensitive um, that that I think, Dal, you said it well, that having that kind of thick skin to be able to say, look, we just want to, this is, this is where we see the most impact. This is where we should put our, um, you know, very important compensation uh, dollars. On the, regarding some of the, com I see some of the comments in the, uh, um, in the chat here, and I think those are just uh, just spot on. I I would say a good a good sales comp analyst. Then from from the perspective that I've had at least, is that um, they're very comfortable with quantitative uh, analyses, dealing with big amounts of numbers. I, I know that sounds silly, but it's really true. Um, and then um, I think more than other compensation related jobs, such as, for example, executive compensation, sales comp requires you to be very, very knowledgeable about the business, about the customer journey, and the impact that every seller role has on that journey. And 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 that's something that's a little bit unique about uh, about this type of role. Yeah, no, I, yeah, agreed. And, and I think, you know, we touched on this a little bit in our previous discussion, but the skill sets, I mean, I'm curious to get your perspective, Aaron, and um, uh, the skill sets to go from the analyst role to that manager. Speaking of career, you know, growth, what do you look for um, when assessing for that? I mean, one of the things that I look for is as you start, you know, showing the signs I would look for, like for somebody who might be ready to move into a management role, are, are starting to think more like the business leaders do. So less on execution, yeah. more on strategy. Um, I would be looking for somebody who also like can start executing, like making decisions and not following decisions. Um, and like somebody who has the ability to see the gray, you know, a lot of times, especially mm -hmm. in, in the HR and finance worlds, things tend to look very black and white. And I, I just see lots and lots and lots of gray in this role. And 
decisions on what is right versus what other factors might be going on and when is an exception appropriate um, you know, what is the precedent going forward if we make an exception and kind of the thought process is down the chain of larger impacts um, and, and decision making is, is really what I would look for. So this is the topic, you know, we had kind of discussed a bit earlier as well around does everyone need to go down the manager path? And I think we, we touched on this a little bit in, in the world of sales comp. Um, there does because of the 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 unique skill sets that are required, you know, we don't think necessarily think of the IC role versus the people manager role as kind of a true bifurcation. But there are, you know, it is a data problem. It is a quantitative problem. Is it? It's a people management problem, a stakeholder management. And to your point, Aaron, to kind of be a good manager, it's a strict strategy and and kind of managing of other business unit problem. So I'm curious how you know what what everyone's takes are. On the, on the topic of creating an IC path versus a management a people management path and how you would think about that in the world of sales comp. Yeah, I can jump in on this one. Um, you know, as I look at my career, you know, I probably spent probably half of it as an individual contributor. And actually, I loved it. I enjoyed it so much that it get, gives you an ability to be a lot more flexible. Um, you know, you're not, you're not worried about what, you know, how you're going to develop other people within your team. Um, you're more focusing on, you know, the strategies and developing those skill sets that you might not be, be able to get as a manager. Um, and it gives you a lot more ability to kind of go across, you know, you can go, and again, you can go as deep as you want and you can go as wide as you want. Um, and I think there's, there's a lot to be said about the individual contributor role as it comes to sales compensation, because sales compensation is becoming more and more complex, right? There's a huge reliance on data, which is always very difficult to get, depending on the systems you have. Um, there's a huge reliance on the strategies in terms of, hey, what motivates different type of levels, right? Now you throw in the different generations of people that are coming into sales. You got the older generation, newer generations, and you know how to keep people motivated in, in different ways. Then you've also got areas around not only just about sales performance, but also how you kind of get to that point you know this and sales compensation sometimes sometimes straddles that line of hey do we just focus purely on performance or are there some very value add activities that we want to compensate people on that will get us to that end goal and there's a lot of those different things and now you got different channels as well right so as an individual contributor you can kind of focus on all those different areas or one particular area where you can kind of really dig deep and almost become a trusted advisor in that area. Um, so I think there's tons, there's tons of opportunity as an individual contributor that can be that can increase your your value to the organization, increase your value to the external market as well, versus just going down a, a manager path. So I'm curious, Aaron or, or, or Mark, on the you know one of the comments um, Mark Harbor just made around. I see that. Yeah, around the comp ceiling. And I think this is kind of the biggest thing in, in roles or departments where the IC and people leader role are two paths you can take. And this is very common in software engineering where, you know, as a developer, you can take the IC path and become a chief architect of, you know, of, of a platform and be at the same comp level or comp tier as a very senior director or people leader in the organization. So how do we think about that within the sales comp space? Because I think that that might be a true statement that you somewhat tap out from a comp perspective, even though there's such a critical role for that, you know, architect of the data owner of the sales comp process. Uh, yeah, I would. Um, I work a lot in, in compensation for both sales comp and people who do sales comp. Um, so I, I've seen this phenomenon. Um, I, 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 in general, there is, you know, way to think about it is there is there is basically the day to day work that goes into sales compensation, uh, and and that does tend to have its own top. Um, the there's another side of it which is the more strategic. What does it look? You know, based on where the organization is going, what's the best way to segment? What's the best way to 
um, uh, you know, staff, what kind of roles do we need, that type of thing. And that that's a higher level uh, of work. Um, what I do see if, if, is that it depends a little bit where your sales compensation group sits. If they sit within rewards and compensation, then there it does, um, you know, that's one direction that it goes. If, you're, if your uh, sales comp is more of a sales operations group that sits within a sales and marketing organization, it might have the opportunity to move in a slightly different, uh, a different way along that more architect path that you were talking about. If it's within the comp area, a lot of cases, it's a function of leadership. You learn your major and then be able to lead people who have other uh, majors as well. Yeah, no, I, 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 I would agree with there. I think where we've seen kind of the IC roles that have scaled within organizations to that, you know, that higher level of comp is where they're owning eff the effective data pipeline, which is ultimately sales comp is the final recipient of all of the upstream mm -hmm. data feeds, right? Whether it's segmentation to territory to quota setting, and they are owning that entire data architecture and, and that process, which is, it's it's actually very tied to comp, but it's also a role that spans much more, more beyond and typically it within yeah. the sales ops function uh, that we typically, yeah, that we see. Um, curious, Aaron, I, I don't know if, if uh, you know, is, is this a role that you would see benefiting? I know Dal and Aaron and I spoke about this a little bit last week, but is this is this a role that you would see as a path in the future of sales comp. And I don't know if it's something that you have today in IC versus the kind of people management role and, and two paths, but just to your perspective on it. Yeah, I think so. So I think some of it is dependent on kind of, uh, like the company too, when you're in a younger company and in growth mode or a startup type environment, you know, I think role scope is really broad. And so it would take a long time for you to reach that like tap out potential because your scope is so broad. Whereas if you're at a more established company and things are more um, like siloed, you would reach that faster. Um, and so, you know, I've been lucky to find myself in a lot of companies that have growth mode and don't have a ton of built out functions. And I've been able to carve out pieces for myself that maybe wouldn't normally or naturally fall within the sales comp role. And that's what we're talking about, like, you know, things that might sit in sales operations like quota setting or rules of engagement or go to market pieces or, you know, account assignments, any of those things. Um, we sort of touch all of those things. And if you're able to do some of that, I think that's one of the, uh, you know, ways that you can get to um, a higher level IC role and be successful there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Unless, unless we have anything else to say, I, I almost wanted to shift back to the role of shifting to manager and would love to get your perspective, Aaron and Dell, and like, what were the biggest challenges you faced going from that, more, you know, IC or even a manager level to owning the entire comp function, the sales comp function? And what are the biggest challenges you have to overcome in, in that shift? So definitely you need to be able to interact with the executives at that level. Right. And that is, that's probably the bigger change where you're probably constantly involved in a lot of those conversations, a lot of the strategy conversation. And then, you know, if you're a working manager, you have to kind of take the, the higher level strategy and bring it down to an execution. Um, and having the ability to kind of talk at both ends, you know, really talk at the strategic level at a high level where people can understand and say, okay, yeah, that's the direction where we want to go and then bring it down to an execution level. You need to have pretty good skills in order to do that. Like you have to have some good experience around that whole compensation scheme. Um, and, and I think that was, that's probably the, one of the, the major things when, when I moved into a, a more of a director role as I was a move, a higher up was, was really making sure that the executives had enough information to make the decision but they're not involved in the finite details of how it gets done, right? Um, and so they also want you to be a they want to they want you to be that trusted advisor. Like they are they they want you to be able to go out and say, hey, what are other companies doing? Obviously, no one's going to tell you what other companies yeah. are doing. You're going to have generalized and saying, hey, here's what you know our industry is. Here's what best practices are. Here's what good looks like, right? And you can have some of those conversations with different different agents, different agencies, and be able to bring that information back right, to the organization. 
Um, and at that level, you know, you really want to be, uh, you really want to be able to kind of provide that level of detail as well as at the same time coach and bring the people up in your team to kind of start thinking at a higher level as well. Right. So not only are you kind of managing up, but you're managing down, right. And making sure that you can elevate that organ, the entire organization. And then you've got so many other layers going across that you're dealing with. You're dealing with the IT organization. In my case, I work in finance. So I'm dealing a lot with uh, sales operations. We're also dealing with, you know, the, the revenue organization, uh, the, um, the revenue accounting, right. In terms of, you know, the, the 606 and all that kind of stuff. So you're, your scope and your responsibilities become a lot bigger and you become that one throat to choke in any in multiple areas, right? So you got to be able to kind of wear the multiple hats and be and, and be able to kind of talk different languages based on who your audience is. And, and that, you know, it's it's tough, but you know, it's definitely doable. Uh, but that's where, you know, having that experience in different areas really helped me as as I kind of looked or looked at looked to kind of get a much broader scope of, uh, of the responsibility around comp. So just to kind of you know step back, you think about you get into this role, you're now responsible for so much more. It's a much broader you know piece. And you want to keep yourself at the more strategic level. The best thing to do is to enable your team to scale up and kind of step into where you were. And so on that note, I think, you know, how do you think about helping your team build up those skills, whether you know the soft skills and the power skills that kind of jump up? Aaron, you talked about this earlier, but kind of the ideal state is having the people below you take on more of the strategic role and thinking like the business leaders that you're trying to support. So what are the things that, you know, that you do and encourage your teams to do to, to scale up from a, a skills perspective? I would try to step out of the way wherever possible and let my team run with things. And, you know, I, I just ask to be kept in the loop of what's going on and let them run with projects that that they feel comfortable running with, but also setting them up to be successful, making sure that I've helped them think through it in advance and that they feel confident going out and you know pushing back or running a project, whatever those decisions are. But some of that is just getting their name out in the organization more um, and, and getting them to become a subject matter expert so people start coming to them instead of me. That's um, the ideal for sure. That point, I think, is uh, a very important point, right? The kind of being able to handle the conversations with those business leaders means being able to push back on senior stakeholders within an organization, being able to have those tough conversations with those senior stakeholders that is not necessarily easy to do for that, you know, maybe someone who's four or five years into their career. Um, and so, you know, again, you know, curious, how do you, enable them to have those difficult discussions for the first time and kind of build up that muscle memory of, of you know, holding other business leaders accountable or pushing back on, on things where we know that they don't meet governance criteria for our sales comp process. Yeah, I'd love to get your input there. I can take a, I, I can give you a couple of thoughts on that. Um, I, this, in uh, our team that we have, um, that uh, that we you know we where we have uh, people who are kind of up and coming in consulting with our clients in a lot of cases um, they will have um, th these deliverables will be going to C-suite level uh, executives in many cases or heads of sales etc. Um, and uh, uh, one of the things that that uh, that I think works really well um, is as they're coming up, building a confidence level in what they're working on. Uh, and I, and, and in a lot of cases doing that by, you know, it, bringing them to meetings, even if they aren't going to actively participate in it initially, um, so that they're ready, so that they hear what's going on. And then Aaron, I think you made a great point. Once they get to that level, it's important to get out of the way because it, uh, we all think that we know the best way to do it. Um, but everybody builds their own style and how they do it. So I, I see good leaders as being able to give your people the comfort confidence and show them how to get confident with solutions that they're going to present and then have them listen to how do you, how do you talk to these key stakeholders that may not agree with you, um, in such a way that you have a productive conversation. 
Um, that's 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 the way I've typically seen it. Yes, yeah, similarly is you know like I think the biggest thing is what Aaron said. You know, just get out of the way, right? Mm -hmm. Let them let them let them fail. If they fail, you're there to pick them up, right? If they do if they do do great, you're there to pat them on the back. Um, and I think that one of the best ways for somebody to learn. Um, you know, one of the things that I normally do is what like Mark has mentioned. You all know, bring people on calls. I'll sort of run the some of the conversation, come back, you know, have a have a a call a call follow up call, you know, with my employees right after that, and say, what did you learn? You know, what what was what was this beneficial for you? Was it not beneficial for you? What would you do next time? What did you like the way the conversation went? Right, like just kind of get them more in, encouraged to kind of open up about the conversation and say, could you do this on your own next time? Or do you, you know, like, oh, may, oh, maybe we should do a couple more together. And then from there, I'm able to kind of take it off, right? And and I think that that could go a long way as well. Is kind of doing something, do not just necessarily doing role playing, but really understanding like, okay, what what worked well, what didn't work well, and and how how would you have done the conversation in that scenario? Yeah, yeah. And no, I think there's a there's a lot of opportunity if you think about it in the life cycle of a career in this in the world of sales comp. There's a lot of opportunity to kind of get those small bite size experiences right you think about you start out um kind of in the day-to-day -day weeds of administration as a junior analyst and you're executing on the sales comp process and and then you know a, a dispute or a question comes in from the sales team and now you know they have the underlying experience with the data it's kind of the time to kind of let them jump in and take on that first that first out that will seem like you know miles of you know miles above what they feel comfortable doing or miles away from what they feel comfortable doing but it's a kind of a good opportunity and then it just kind of grows more and more into um, taking on more of the strategy and the plan and the plan design, uh, you know, experience and opportunity. And so I think what we, what we see that works very, very well is when you have, you know, a profile and a role that kind of, sh that it's able to ship through from administration or sending the data and the pipelines to, um, you know, to ultimately kind of scaling uh, to more of the strategic side. Something we, you know, something you had said last week, um, down, I think, uh, and Aaron, you touched on this as well as kind of enabling, enabling your team to make relationships and connections with the other stakeholders across the organization and the importance of that, given how tied sales comp is to all these other, all these other divisions and groups. And so I'm curious there, how you kind of foster that, um, you know, that the connectivity and, and building those, those types of, um, connections throughout the organization. Yes, some of them are just, they need to be done organically, right? Like you, if you're relying on other parts of the business to provide you information, you have to have those conversations with them. You have to need to understand how you guys are getting the data. What, you know, what is the, the scope and the criteria that you're using? And I encourage my team to go have those conversations. I'm not going to do it for you. You guys need to go and have those conversations. You need to understand, you have to build the cadence with them, right? If you, if you want to have a regular, regular conversation or how often you want to meet with them. So, you know, some of my team members have been working directly with sales operations and other people of finance, payroll, whatnot, uh, you know, depending on what they need and who they who they who their stakeholders are, right? And sometimes we're providing information to other people, right? And other other times we're getting information from other people. So it kind of goes both ways. And I just formally push them to kind of have the conversation with those individuals. And if things are not going as well as they expected, then we can come back and have more of a you know, an escalation conversation and necessary, but it's really, I kind of push it to them to kind of understand who, who your business partners are, what information they're, that, that they're using, that you're providing for them, what they're providing for you and make sure that you guys are on the same page and what's required. That makes sense. So you enable your team, you let them make the mistakes, learn from their mistakes. You let, you know, you celebrate the successes. I guess I'm curious, what metrics do you guys use to track the effectiveness of your team and how how well it's operating at both the kind of a team level and also an individual level? I mean, one big unofficial metric is um, if I don't hear about something, but I know it's being done, that means it's being done well. And I, I don't know a thing about it. So that's always a great thing. Like I know someone's taken something over. Um, so that, that's a great one. Um, 
a lot of times, you know, people will solicit feedback if they have a great experience with your employee too. And so you'll hear that organically in your own conversations. Um, and, and then in terms of setting like official, you know, parameters and goals, I mean, we goal set several times a year. Um, and, and I make it a point to go back and touch base on, um, you know, what, like, are you not only are you achieving those goals, but like, are we going where you want to go? Like, what is your goal for yourself? What things do you want to take over from me? What things are being done that you want to do? Um, and just giving people a chance to stretch their legs so that they, you know, can stay happy and fulfilled and feel like, you know, they're moving forward all the time. Yeah, no, it's, it's a, uh, it's a great point on the, the silence. The silence is deafening in sales comp. If it's silent, you know, it's working. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or it's working too well it's working too <laughs> yeah. well yeah yes yeah exactly fair enough <laughs> um so this is an interesting one you goal set you know kind of twice a year how do you celebrate the small wins because sales comp is such a tolling right like it's a thankless role you no one no one's calling you out saying thank you for processing payroll on time and accurately and giving me you know, maybe sometimes, <laughs> maybe sometimes, but rarely is it, they're, you know, they're calling you when there's a problem. And so how do you uh, enable, you know, the celebration of, you know, we did this, we did this payroll cycle better than we did last, last time. And we're, we're making that progress. You know, are you enable, are you bringing those kind of metrics into your performance management at all? Um, I would say not as often as we probably should. I mean, we kind of speeded up certain processes, you know, close the the monthly close and everything else. It was just a requirement that we had. Um, you know, the way I try to try to, uh, it's not like a big reward, right? You know, some you know, as you know, ca cash can be pretty tight, but you know, a simple thank you can go a long way, right? Simple, hey, I appreciate what you did on this. Um, you know, you have your, man, you know, you, you, my manager, you want to kind of put them on an email or whatever and say, hey, you know, this person has done a great job. We just want to thank, thank to their contributions. Um, and that, you know, that that's quite satisfying as well. I mean, every once in a while, very occasionally, you might do a spot bonus for something that's done an outstanding job, but those become more and more difficult to get approved. Um, but, you know, doing simple thank yous, telling them, hey, take a couple of days off, you know, don't worry about, you know, putting it as a as a day off you know just enjoy yourself you know spend an extra long weekend with your family you know just simple things like that can go a long way i'm curious to get your perspective on, on this but i i find that the other stakeholders outside of sales comp acknowledging and recognizing the work done by sales comp goes a very far way with the team and so it's almost kind of building a culture within the organization where those projects, those extra initiatives, that last minute push to get something done that kind of fell outside. It's how do you encourage other stakeholders? Or I mean, I guess, do you do you have a process? Do you have a way to, to kind of enable that feedback loop, which then further strengthens the relationship and the accountability of your team to the other stakeholders? Yeah, most definitely. Like, especially if we're doing like a, a long-term project, I usually ask the executive sponsor, like if so many members on my team have done a great job, I actually get them to kind of acknowledge that, right? And typically, normally they do, like, you know, they normally kind of send up a, a broad email saying, hey, they're thanking all these people and they kind of name a few people on that. Um, but that's one way that we try to look at, especially when we're doing a project that's going to take a significant amount of time and has a significant uh, impact on the organization. We all, I always try to make sure that they, they, there's some acknowledgement there of, of the support that the sales compensation team has provided them. I always share the feedback I hear too, even if it's just everyday ordinary stuff. So-and-so said, you're great, by the way, they had a great talk with you or whatever. I always try to make sure that they hear that feedback. And then, you know, things like too, president circle nominations and things like that. If I hear good feedback or something on one of my team, I'll say, hey, maybe you could nominate her this year. Um, and try to get them to, even if they don't win, just knowing they've been nominated is an honor. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think um, it's, there's an element of, um, you know, we, we, we typically see this, if you look at the, the, the tenure of the average sales professional, it's very like, it's kind of a two-ended, uh, or you know, kind of a distribution that's very, bifocal so you have like a average tenure of 18 months or an average tenure of 10 years and i think that bridge of kind of going from that initial role of being in sales comp to kind of 
going down the career path, um, I think there there needs to be the kind of path and the journey of the career growth and sales comp, which we talked about as kind of being more and more readily available. The other is making making it a rewarding and um, and fulfilling path, which I think you know from a perspective of the problems that we solve every day, that's certainly there. But it's it's how do you overcome some of the the stressful aspects of sales comp, and I think this kind of feedback and coaching goes a long way um, to to getting through and. Um, you know, personally, having been at that kind of that, you know, fiscal year turnover, those thank you emails go far, you know, in my early in my career, those thank you emails went a long way in terms of kind of getting me through to the, the you know, the, the calm uh, post uh, that fiscal year turnover. But, you know, I'm curious, you know, broadly, I know we're, we're you know, we're, we're getting close to time and would love to, to leave some, uh, some time for a Q&A here. Um, you know, are there any other best practices that in, that you'd like to share with the broader audience in terms of, you know, coaching or or um, uh, the way you think about, you know, motivating your team? I've, I've found um, just uh, basic ongoing communication is a big deal. Um, I think one of the errors that new managers tend to make is is kind of assuming that the people who are reporting into you are automaton, so to speak, um, but not they're not. They're emotional beings. And so you can't be a manager, no matter how technical your 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 discipline is, if you don't understand those components, you won't be able to be a good manager um, because those are what make the difference. Um, uh, in, in a, and that's why you see a lot of managers of technical people who don't know that much about it, but they do a great job because they understand how to lead, even if they don't understand um, the discipline. So what I found works well is to just be very, have open and regular communication and make it a discipline for me as, as, as a leader. I, I, if I haven't talked to somebody in a couple of weeks, I'm just going to give them a call and, and just check in and not with a formal message. Hey, I saw you did this, or I want to celebrate you for this doing, just being, Hey, what's up, man. Uh, we haven't talked in a while, um, you know, that type of thing. That way, when you have to do a tough message, you know, something didn't go right and you want to provide some feedback, it's not, you know, a guillotine. It's just, you know, hey, this could have gone a little bit better. What do you think we should do about it? You know, and that's that that's a lot more um, engaging uh, and a better way to communicate. But I think that's the big difference for me, at least. Yeah. The only yeah. other comment I just want to add is like, you know, it is a thankless job and it is a job filled with conflict. And so I think it's so important to publicly back each other up no matter what and have conversations behind closed doors, but present a united front at all times. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree with all the comments you guys yep. made. And, you know, the, 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 you know, the more frequent check-ins for me have been working really well. Like even if it's a 10, 15 minute conversation, just to see how you're doing, you know, it doesn't have to be directly with your manager. It could be a skip level as well, right? Um, and and again, it's just it's just a check in, and you know, I like I like the the informal nature of that, right? Because it's you, you're not overbearing, right? You're just kind of having a simple conversation, talking about you know what they did in the weekend, what they have planned for them for the weekend, um, and then if something you know naturally comes out about, hey, here's here's an issue I want to talk to you about, that's fine, right? And I think that's that's really sort of kind of building that internal relationship and then also having them kind of using that as how they would leverage having those conversations out externally as well um so i you know just having those quick check-ins and just keep things keep things flowing and moving i think is very important no yeah 100 i think uh you know one 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 thing i'm gonna add to mark's comment around the being you know quick thank yous what i found is that when you call someone and have a conversation with them to say thank you, and you have a longer time, everyone is 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 you know very humble and 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 wants to say no 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 it wasn't a big deal, and so sometimes when I just really want to just say thank you, I will have a one minute conversation. I actually open it up by, to, to to someone on my team and will say, I only have one minute. I'm only calling you because I just wanted to say thank you for X Y and Z. Okay, I have to go, and it's like just sets the you don't need to make excuses for why you did a good job and you don't need to take that back. It's just about kind of enabling the team because again, we all do it, right? It's, it's a natural thing. But, um, uh, and with that, you know, I think I'd love to open it to the floor and see if there's any, any, any questions, 
that we have for the panel. No questions. Everyone has, um, let me actually see. I think there's there's one piece that we didn't touch on, which maybe uh, while people think of questions or if they have, if anyone has any other questions that I'd love to state is to me, the something that you, you know, you touched on is that that kind of come the combined or unified front as a team. Aaron, I think there's there's certainly a you know a point there of we can learn from our mistakes, and I think that's everyone has to learn you know from their mistakes. I think the one the one thing that you know to touch on from what I've seen in the world of sales comp is it's a role where credibility I mean is the trust in that team is built up over a long period of time, and if it starts to erode, it just goes you know it it, it can go quickly and it creates a Magn orders of magnitude more work that's unjustified because now you're having to defend things that we know you know are right and that and you're having to have conversations that you shouldn't be having um and so i think you're almost always better presenting that unified front coming back having the coaching session even if you have to go back and course correct the the discussion and the points that that were made and uh i think that's a very astute comment um yep so I think, and then yeah, one other point here um, that Mike Mike uh, is bringing up: um, quarterly, like frequency, you know, frequency of of performance check-ins. How often are you doing it, and and does it matter on the tenure of the role and the individual that you have on your team? Try to do it um, at least twice a quarter. Right, just to see how things are going track. And again, it's not like, hey, where are you at with these targets? It's just like, how are things going? How are they progressing? What, where can I help you? Right, what challenges and barriers can I help you know, alleviate? Um, I, I think the more frequent you can do it, the better it is, because it kind of gives you a better, better opportunity to kind of course correct if there's not going wrong, or if, you, if the expectations were unclear, you can kind of say, hey, well, wait a minute, uh, that really wasn't what I was expecting. I, I was, I was thinking about this, and then you kind of have that have more conversation versus waiting three months or six months down the road is like, oh, well, you completely missed the mark, right? So, so having that that more regular, regular, regular discussions, even, you know, twice a quarter for me works out pretty well. Yeah, especially, yeah. yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Mark. Oh, uh, I the only thing I was gonna, I completely agree. The, I was gonna add uh, a little bit of my, uh, uh, my own lesson that I learned in that space um, in that, uh, if you stick to kind of longer time between checking in with people, you don't always have full information to be able to make an accurate judgment. And as a, when, you know, when I was a new manager, I did make that mistake where I'd say, you know, provide some feedback and, you know, well, didn't you pay attention to this because I did that. And of course I didn't know about it. And that was a mistake on my part. And it was a learning on my part that, you know, that that you've got to have as much information as you you know as as reasonable and as feasible and the easiest way to do that is those more frequent interactions um and that's just been my personal <laughs> that's the scars that i bear <laughs> yeah I, I think one like one one practice that we've applied that's worked very well is to kind of tie the performance feedback cycle to the cadence and the scale of the project that someone is taking on so mm -hmm. if you have a team member that's scaled and now they're taking on projects that are that quarterly or like annual level, right? They're doing a big, broad implementation. They're, they're managing these projects that are a much bigger scale. You can kind of performance manage them in a longer cadence of time without having those and necessarily the level of surprise. When you have someone that's in, new in a role and every payroll cycle, like every month is effectively a whole new month. If you're missing opportunities to kind of quickly course correct and, and, re, and, and kind of up level them, by learning from the mistakes that they have. And so I think, um, yeah, that's that's kind of the way that we've approached it, is kind of tying it back to the, the ultimately the tenure and the scale of, of the project that they, they own. Um, I think there is, um, I would say, yeah, so this is actually, um, there's a few, few messages here. One is, um, a few questions that I'm getting. So outside of, you know, like if you're a sales comp professional, what are the sources that 
that you can go to to get more guidance and learn about best practices to kind of like what, what are the resources that you push towards your team to kind of go and learn and, and scale? Um, World at Work has some fantastic resources. You have to cost a little bit more money, right? But if you can get that approval, I think there's a, so much information that there's there that's available there. I think that's probably one of the my major sources when I go to look at that. You can also contact, um, you know, like an Alex Elner group or some 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 group like that, just to kind of get an idea of what they're seeing in the market. Some of them are pretty good. They won't charge for initial conversation, but if you want to kind of get into more of an engagement, obviously then that uh, definitely costs money. Um, but just having conversations like that with external uh, consultants helps a lot. Even you know, reaching out through LinkedIn to somebody that that is in the compensation world and just throwing out some ideas. Um, you know, I think Nabil, you introduced me to somebody uh, a couple of years ago, and I, you know, I reach out to them every once in a while. I was like, hey, what are you guys doing about this, right? Um, and just kind of having a, a formal introduction where you can kind of foster that relationship, you know, outside, you know, outside of your organization. I think that's also worked well as well. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, exactly. It's like there's the, uh, I would say, there's kind of the experts with broad company experience working across multiple companies. I mean, Mark is an example working with multiple organizations from a sales comp perspective. Um, that's kind of one 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 avenue. Um, I do think the peer connecting with peers, you know, it's the more we can minimize the need to invent the wheel and can mm -hmm. learn from individuals that have solved these same problems, because not every business has gone through every single challenge at the same time. And so like, you know, there's likely a business that's going through the same challenge you've gone through today or going through today, but, you know, a few years ago and, um, and kind of reaching out to, to, to those individuals to do so. I know we're, we're kind of at the time. I think um, there's one last question uh, that I want to make sure I get to, which is from a sales comp team perspective, what are some successful ways to engage with sales managers and sales staff? And, um, you know, for this one, I, maybe I'll start with some, one of my own examples. I think, you know, engaging with the sales team to get feedback on both the comp plan and or kind of reporting, dashboarding, any, any sort of elements of that, it kind of, I've seen that be a great way to kind of build a relationship, especially if you can action on some of those things and build that trust. And then over time, it's, you know, start looping and engaging in, in other ways. But I'm curious uh, if, to wrap up here, if there's anything else, Dell, Aaron, or, or Mark, that you'd add. I think, yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a great, great way to engage. Uh, one of the other things that we do is we kind of do a formal compensation rollout, right? And if you're not doing that, I encourage you to kind of put that as part of your the sales enablement plan, you know, at the beginning of the year, or even as a refresher that you might do at the middle of the year, um, just to kind of get, keep your name out there and make sure that you, they understand who you are, what the comp plans is. It's kind of sometimes you can have a bunch of new hires and they're just like, oh, I don't even know what, you know, how I get paid. So just kind of having that ability to opportunity to kind of get in front of them on a, on a live session, you know, whether it be a webinar or whatever it may be, just doing a live session or a refresher around the comp plan, right? And, and it could be repetitive, and yep. some people might want to join, some people might not want to join, but at least you kind of you're out there in front of their in front of them. Yeah. No, I love that. Yeah. And 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 uh there's so much value in it. You build the relationships, but it's ultimately benefiting the sales team and the sell and the sellers themselves. So you're kind of adding value both ways. Um no, I just want to uh just to wrap up here, you know, I want to thank uh you know everyone for for joining and, and the audience for being so active and, and asking great questions and a adding some great commentary. Um, and ultimately, you know, I, I want to thank Aaron, Dal, and Mark for joining today. I, you know, your perspective and your background has been tremendously uh, valuable, and and goes to and be an example of kind of sharing back and providing resources to the rest of the sales comp community. So, thank you all for for participating. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.